TitleMatchNetwork.com. Early members of Paulie. I worked with Paul in AWA. Right. So I, I had already known Paul a little bit in AWA. Um, and Paul and I were never really friends. You know, we weren't enemies, but I just, he wasn't my kind of guy and I wasn't his kind of guy. So we stayed on opposite ends of the, the spectrum, so to speak. Uh, and I didn't really interface with Paul that much in WCW either. Um, and he left, you know, before I really got involved in the business side of WCW. We'll talk. When was the first time you heard of ECW? I don't recall. Okay. Did you follow the product at all or watch it for the talent at all or no? No. And that's another narrative that certain people that used to work there and I still joke about today is, you know, Paul Heyman was a master at rallying the troops and creating the enemy and the bad guy so that people would rally around him and, 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 and build his team. But so much of the crap that I've heard about me stealing people from him, trying to put him out of business. And I, I never watched his show. I mean, I've probably dropped in on, I'm not even sure I got it when I lived in Atlanta, to be honest with you. And if I did, I don't recall watching it much. Anything I watched would have been on tape, if I recall. And it was clips of it. But there was nothing there that, A, I liked. And it's funny. Uh, here's an example. I've never liked the hardcore style. It's just never been. No, I realize, you know, I also don't like scalp potatoes. Doesn't mean other people shouldn't, but right. I don't. But this, everybody that knows me has known, I've always felt this way. And I was talking to a bully on the phone yesterday while I was on my way here. He said, hey, what are you doing? I said, I'm going to Philadelphia. He goes, ah, oh, you're going to the hardcore capital world, and everybody knows how much you love that. And it was a joke because I've, I've never appreciated that presentation. And I certainly wouldn't want to have mimicked it or tried to copy it or do anything that Paul Heyman was doing at the time, A, because it's just not my taste, and B, I couldn't have gotten away with it anyway. Paul was able to get away with so much of the stuff that he did because he was under the radar. He used music that he didn't have the rights to to help get his guys over because he was so under the radar that he didn't get sued. I was Turner Broadcasting. If I would have done that, it would have cost us hundreds of thousands of dollars in fines and fees. I couldn't have done that. And the, the style and the presentation of, of his show at the time was such that it would have never worked for my network. If you weren't familiar with uh, the talents in ECW, who was advising you as to what talents were out there? I don't recall. It, it depends. Um, depends on who it was. Sometimes I got phone calls directly from the talent. Other times they would go, most of the time it would come through other talent that they knew. Like Kevin or Conan or something? Yeah, it depends on who it was. Okay. Um, what are your memories of the deal sending Bobby Eaton and Arn Anderson to ECW to help promote the Slamboree pay-per-view in, in Philly? And, yeah. and why didn't a working relationship with ECW continue after that? I, you know, honestly, I don't remember that. You know, I do remember, and I don't know if it was, I don't know if it, if it was associated with that moment or not. But I, I think, think it was it, a legal thing and then you guys Trade of talent just for... Yeah, I do remember having a meeting with Paul in Orlando one, one evening. I think it was in Orlando. So I was probably there doing TV anyway. And we talked about trying to do something together. And that may have been you know, how that manifests, but I, I really don't recall. Okay. Get Sabu was brought in for the first few months of WCW Nitro, but gone within two months. What happened that Sabu wasn't signed to a long-term deal? You know, I, I don't remember the period of time when Sabu came in. I mean, obviously he did. I, but I don't remember the the... The situation with him or what, you know, why we brought him in or what predicated him leaving, to be honest with you. Okay. You know, WWF built a working relationship with Paul during that time period. Why didn't WCW pursue that as as well since, you know, Paul and Kevin Sullivan went back a long way? And looking back, do you, do you wish that you had done that at all? Uh, why didn't I? I mean, I, as we talked about earlier, I think I attempted to at one point do try to work with Paul. Um, and it didn't work out for whatever reason that I can't recall. Um, do I regret that we didn't do it? No, I, I don't. Okay. What was your relationship like with Paul before you started running WCW and then after the Monday Night War began? You know, I, I was distrustful of Paul in the AWA. To me, he came off as kind of a, as many small promoters do, and we were small promoters in the AWA at the time. He was working very closely with a guy by the name of Rob Russon. Yep. And it's just, you know, my gut instinct was, uh, I'm going to stay over here. I'll let this guy do this thing. That was, just, that was just my impression. And I never really got to know Paul, so it was an unfair impression. 
Um, he left WCW shortly after I was really involved too much. And then after, after he left in the ECW thing, I, you know, I became the mortal enemy and, and the catalyst for, you know, everything that he was doing, according to people that used to work there at the time. And he said a lot of things about me that weren't true, which kind of reinforced the earlier perception I had of him. I was like, God, I was right about it. I mean, he's kind of a sleazebag. But, you know, subsequently I got to know Paul when I went to work at WWE and you know, we got along fine. I respect him now. I mean, you know, it's easy to look back 20 years now and make judgments, but now I respect him. Heyman would often tell stories of suing WCW. How often did that actually happen? <laughs> I think he threatened once or twice, um, but nothing ever happened. Paul was very, uh, there was a lot of hyperbole when it came to that. Okay. When WWF began working with ECW, you called that uh, the biggest threat to WCW. I think it was a prodigy chat with Bob Ryder. Why did you feel that way at the time? What was the question again? Um, when WWF began working with ECW, you called it the biggest threat to WCW. God, I don't recall that. Um, when ECW booked their first pay-per-view, I think it was March of 97, barely legal, WCW booked a Nitro taping the next night in Philly. When ECW show was uh, postponed, I guess, under April, WCW then booked the day after their new date for Philly. Would you not consider that to be aggressive behavior against a much smaller promotion? If not, why was the taping moved? It's a lot of questions right there. It's a lot of questions, and quite honestly, I don't recall that it ever really happened. If it did, I, I honestly, and I, I mean, I, right. I had nothing to lose at this time. It's not like I'd be embarrassed. I mean, I did a lot of aggressive shit, so I would actually be proud of it. Um, but I don't recall that it, that happened. And if it did, I'm not sure why it was. What are your memories of uh, One Night Stand as a show and as a launching point for the new brand? As a show, um, <clears throat> I had a blast. I mean, again, you know, kind of supporting what I said to you earlier. I never really followed ECW much. I didn't really quite understand um, the passion for it in New York or in Philadelphia and some of the markets they were famous for and embedded in. Um, I knew I had heat with the ECW fans because of all the stuff that Paul had done and, and guys like Steve Austin did and, and Mick Foley. And, you know, I was, I was a good whipping boy. If you wanted to get yourself over in ECW, all you had to do is bury Eric Bischoff. Right. It was kind of like falling down. You know, it was very easy to do. Um, and, and that's cool. And I understand it. I understood it then. Um, but I didn't understand the magnitude of it, you know, with that core audience. So when I heard about it, it was like, oh, great. We get to do a show in New York. I love going to New York. It's fun. It'll be fun. And when I got to the arena, well, when they opened up the arena, I'd gotten there quite a bit earlier. But when the people were there, and I don't remember everything that I did, obviously, but the fucking heat I had there was awesome. Yeah. And, and I love that. I love great heat. I mean, great heat, great sex. You know, lottery tickets, all kind of the same thing to me. It's, it was really, really fun. And I love to perform in that kind of environment. Um, so it was it was great. I remember, I don't remember how it happened, but I was somehow involved with Bully and Diva. Uh, and we were working out a spot. And I said, hey, why don't you guys, you know, haul me outside and throw me in a garbage bin? I said, really? You'd let us do that? I'm like, yeah. Let's do that. And then it'll be a part of the finish. All right. <laughs> and I think it was bully. And it dumped me back there. You know, now that I think about it, it's like, God, I could have gotten tetanus. And I'm sure it wasn't the cleanest thing. In Especially around. in New York City. Yeah. I can't, can't imagine doing it now. But back then, I was like, fucking crowd will love it. Let's <laughs> do it. What are your memories of signing Mike Awesome when he was still under uh, contract to ECW? I don't, a, I don't know that he was still under contract. We wouldn't have signed him had we known he was under contract. If I recall correctly, there was some ambiguity as to whether or not a contract had ever been signed by Paul. I don't remember that specifically. But Mike Awesome was uh, related to Hulk. He was a good guy. Um, Hulk really wanted him in. And we determined that he was free and clear. So we hired him. In hindsight, do you think Mike was uh, worth signing back then? For the role that he played? Yeah, I, don't, yeah, I do. It's not like we made him the world heavyweight champion. You know, he, he came in. We we had a lot of TV to produce, and we needed good talent. When Goldberg was turned heel in Baltimore, uh, I believe it was 2000 Great American Bash, there was a big surprise that, you know, was teased in the weeks leading to the show. At the time, there were rumors that WCW was trying to bring in an ECW for a working relationship. Was there anything to that? 
Not that I recall. Okay. I think so much of you know your, your questions probably reflect a lot of the narrative that was artificially created to to kind of recreate the kind of war between yeah. WCW and WWE at the time. And I think Paul tried to draft a lot of of that interest. I you know there just I can tell you, and I would say this to Paul, there was never there was never this we got to drive them out of business uh, mentality. That, you know, it just wasn't. They were not a threat to us. What are your thoughts on when uh, WWE re- resurrected ECW in 2005? I didn't quite understand it, to be honest with you. I, Again, you know, and this is very personal, meaning it's, it's my unique perspective. But I go back and I, and I think about, okay, what, what was ECW? Looking back now, and it's not when it, when, it, when it was happening, but looking at back now, what was it? It was a show that was on TNN that hardly anybody watched, that did very small pay-per-view buy rates, that never made any money, that never had any licensing, never had any merchandising, never did an international tour. It was a small, rather insignificant, but very... Insignificant in, in in the business in the measure in the sense of being financially measurable. Obviously, their fan base was passionate, very passionate. But from a purely business perspective, what was it? And and the reason that there was passion and the reason that the product was unique and different than and there were many reasons, but one of them was the sheer level of violence and the extreme, no pun intended, that, that they would go to, pre- to present their product. I didn't understand when they brought it to WWE how you could try to pick that package up as raw and crude as it was to gain the passion that it did and then pick it up and move it over here into something that's relatively sterile and commercial by comparison. Right. It just seemed like a square peg in a round hole to me. So you pretty much knew right from the get go that it wouldn't really take off again. I didn't. I, I can't say that I knew. I just. I just. Again, I wasn't involved in the, in the discussions or decisions at that time. Obviously, with WWE, but it, it just seemed like a square peg in a round hole to me. Why do you think there isn't a huge surge of uh, WCW nostalgia like there is for ECW? I think Paul Heyman did a phenomenal job creating brand loyalty for his product in a very small handful of markets that were, and still are in many respects, um, passionate about his product. Had WWE not exposed that product and helped lift that perception of that brand and its significance to a whole different television audience, I don't think there would have ever been as much, at least, uh, of that nostalgia that you talk about outside of the markets like Philadelphia, for example, and some of the other markets that were right. successful. In. I think it's a very isolated loyalty. I don't think anybody in Dallas, Texas, is very few people are loyal to the ECW brand outside of those that were made loyal to it through the efforts of WWE by kind of representing it. Had it not been for the re presentation of it, it would probably still be a nostalgic kick at the Manhattan Center. TitleMatchNetwork.com